pray. Amen. Why don't we do a little bit of Bible study? I know what you've been thinking. That crazy guy, what's it actually like studying the Bible with this dude? So, rather than go through some theological treatise on why the resurrection is true, we're just diving right in to this passage. We're going to go verse by verse. So settle in. I hope the coffee was strong. (laughs) Chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week. What's the last day of the week for the Jewish calendar? Saturday. So the first day of the week is Sunday. This is why Christians take Sunday as our holy day versus Saturday from our Hebrew ancestors. Early on the first day, while it was still dark. This is going to take me a while since I haven't gotten through first one yet. <clears throat> while it was still dark, the gospel writer of John, we have four gospels. Can you say them with me? M. John writes like a mo- like it's a movie but some, most modern readers don't have like this kind of imagery for it when G- when John writes about how much light is in the room it's like music it's like background music and background music usually gives you a sense of what's going to happen in a scene right it doesn't take you may not have even seen the movie but if i do this da da That's two notes, but you know exactly what's about to happen. When John writes, it's early in the morning, not yet sunrise. That's 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 a clue that whatever's about to happen, they're not gonna get it. If you read John, John the famous passage of John 3:16, that's Nicodemus. It's the middle of the night. Nicodemus does not understand what's happening. The, woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, it's the noonday. She walks away, becomes one of the first evangelists. So with John, it's very early in the morning. It's not yet sunrise. She gets to the tomb. She sees that the stone had been rolled away. She's going to prepare the body. You see, Jesus died on a Friday. After once Sabbath had already kicked in. And if it's Sabbath, Jewish folks aren't allowed to work. They weren't allowed to go through the proper burial ointments and uh, performances for Jesus' body. So she is going to the tomb, not just to cry, but to actually perform the rites. When she gets there, she's there early in the morning to try to beat anybody, to see the stone rolled away. She's assuming a grave robbery has occurred. She runs back and tells the disciples, and it's Simon Peter, I'm going to shorten it to just a Peter, and what's named as the other disciple. Church legend has that the other disciple is shorthand for John, the actual writer of this passage. Like it would have been uncouth for them to just say, me and Peter went running to the tomb, right? I don't know if I buy it, totally but this what happens next I really like because the writer of this passage makes with excruciating detail that the other disciple the one Jesus loved beat Peter to the tomb (laughs) I don't know what your friendships are like with your people but if I was writing one of the most important documents for a whole religion, and one of the details was I could beat you in a foot race, you better believe I'm writing it down. <laughs> That's about as human as it gets. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter to the tomb first. He bent down and saw the linen wrappings lying there. And then Simon and Peter came following him, went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, but it was rolled up in a place by itself. The fact that the disciples come into the tomb, not only is the stone rolled away, the, if Jesus' body was stolen, they would not have unwrapped the body. That's what they're noticing. That's the, the next movement in this story. They are seeing, huh, something else has happened. Then the other disciple who ran to the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. This is, this is great. He saw and believed, but yet did not understand. 
man, how much of the church believes but doesn't understand? How much of my life has been spent believing but not understanding? Then the disciples returned to their homes. They just went home. But there's Mary chasing after them, right? She had told them about the empty tomb and she comes and she is filled with grief. She stands outside weeping at the tomb. And this is a really fun little passage. As she wept and bent over to look inside the tomb, she saw two angels in white. And it gives the detail. One at the head and one at the foot on the place that they had laid Jesus. This is one of those like, they skip over in a lot of sermons because it's like, what do you do with this? I bring it up every time I read this passage because I kind of love it. I love it because it's at, well, some of you may not have spent the time with the Bible that I have, but some of you might be involved in the gospel according to Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> if you don't remember it, you can say, you know, my Easter homework this year is to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> Classic. But if you, for those of you who remember, the Ark is actually from the Bible. It's the Ark of the Covenant. It was God's presence. When, when the Jewish people were wandering the desert, that was where God's presence rested. And if you look at it, the thing that you'll see, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant is a dish. And one at the head and one on the other side of that are two angels doing this bit. And that dish is actually where the offering was laid. And that place is called the mercy seat. Because that was where all that separated the people of Israel from God, where the moment that the reconciliation happened, happened. So she notices the mercy seat. When she said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Come on now. Come on now. Some of you have only known for about a year and a half. We're going on two years. Thanks be to God. But if you saw me suffer and die and I came back and you didn't recognize me, I'd be hurt. <laughs> and this happens in all the Gospels. He's, he's just not recognized. The people who knew him best do not see him. They don't recognize him. Now you can talk about how it's a traumatic experience and she wouldn't have been expecting to see Jesus. But hear this narrative hook. Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Supposing him to be the gardener. Supposing him to be the gardener. Why would she think he's the gardener? Well, it's early morning. They happen to be in a garden. I'm sure. Well, those, are, those are good points. The other is a theological one. The way John is written, there's a list of seven miracles. The first one, the most fun one, water into wine, my spirit of hope choir. Thank you. <laughs> the first miracle, according to John, is water into wine. And you can count them throughout there, that there's all of these miracles. The resurrection is the eighth. Now, you don't need to be a biblical scholar. What has seven in it? In the Bible. Seven days of creation, right? On the seventh day, God rested what is the eighth day? The new week, the new creation. When did, where did creation start in the, according to scripture? Did it start in a city? It starts in a garden. The new creation is starting in the same kind of place as the last creation. What was God in the first creation? A gardener. And his son is just like him, a chip off the old block. Jesus is looking so much like God, the creator of all things, that Mary 
thinks she sees a gardener. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will go and get him. And this is the moment. This is the moment of high drama. This is, this is everything. She's looking. It's early in the morning. You remember when this passage started, the sun had not come out yet. Yet. She's confused. She doesn't know who's in front of her. And then he says her name. Mary. He says it with the authority that made light come into being. Jesus says it with the announcement and the proclamation, like a parent over a child, like a spouse to their beloved, calls it so clearly that it removes the veil of all confusion from her, and she knows who's standing in front of her. My friends, if there is a Christian vision of what happens when we die, this is it. Have you lost someone? Have you ushered someone where you've held their hand in their final moments and you know that you're just hoping that there's something on the other side that will catch them? And you're wondering like where in your imagination you can fit that? It's right here. It's kind of blurry. There's confusion. And then the voice that brought you into being calls them by name. That's resurrection. She turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She's calling him by the name she remembers. She wants to hold on to him. Jesus says to her, do not hold on to me. Now, I've seen this played out in Christian art quite a bit, where Jesus seems like the coldest, like most distant, like, do not touch me, for I have ascended, like, I have not ascended to my father or your father. Don't get this twisted. I think there's a hug. I think there's a hug. I've lost enough people that if I got to see someone come back from the dead, even for a minute, I would go through a wall to hug them. What Jesus is saying when he says, do not hold on to me, is tied to her calling him teacher. When she sees him resurrected, she's thinking it's going to go back to the way it was. We're going to go back out to the Galilee. We can get back on that boat. He's going to do the thing with the fish and the loaves and the wine. Thank God. We're going to have all the teachings. I get to hear the Beatitudes again. You know that's my favorite song. You know I love it when he does that thing. And when Jesus is saying to her is, it's not going to be like it was. You can't go back. We're not going backwards. We're going forwards. And that can be one of the hardest things to do, to move on, to grow. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things. So, I don't know which churches you've been in, but, uh, for someone to go to a gathering of people who have followed Jesus and to announce the good news that he has resurrected from the dead sounds to, and, and, and then also elaborates on the things that Jesus said, sounds to me like a sermon. Am I right? Let me see some head nods. So maybe the first sermon given after the resurrection was from a woman. Just a little bit to take with you. Now, that's the reading, but I want to ask you something. If, you come, if, if, if you're a regular here, one of the things that I, would, uh, I hope get, has gotten old for some of you is my approach to Scripture and Bible study. You are not reading the Bible correctly until you are seeing yourself in the text. 
until you found a place in the story that you are like, yep, that, that's me. Or maybe you're a little projecting, that, uh, that's somebody else. <laughs> Sometimes saying that's me can be a little bit too, uh, uh. so where are you? Maybe you're the, the disciples. You've followed Jesus before. You've heard, you've, you, you've heard many a good sermons. You know, you, 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 can, you know a couple of the Ten Commandments. A couple of them. <laughs> the important ones. But the resurrection? You believe, but you don't quite get why. My friends... There's a way. Until you have encountered this great love, uh, it's not going to break. It's got to break the heart of stone. Maybe you're those are the apostles, but maybe you're part of the greater disciples who, throughout the rest of this resurrection passage and all the resurrection narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all of them have disciples who. St- doubted that Jesus was resurrected? Do you have doubts? Do you have questions? Are you still skeptical? Are you still thinking, ah, I don't know about this resurrection? If that's you, you, according to our tradition, you are in great company. But I'm going to tell you, the only way to see through your questions and your doubts, the only way, the only other side of all of our wonderings and musings, all of our skepticism, is if love finds its way to you. Maybe you're merry on the earlier side of the story because your heart has been filled with grief over a loss that has consumed you. And if you have never had a loss consume you, Good for you. God bless you. And you would give anything, like Mary, you would give anything to go back to the way things used to be. And the thought of letting go and moving on seems otherworldly. My friends, love finds a way. Love will break through. Resurrection breaks through. where I see myself is following in the footsteps of this first sermon. I follow in the footsteps of this great saint of Mary Magdalene who proclaims not what she has heard from someone else, not from some book that she read about, but what she has seen with her own eyes. I have seen the resurrected Christ in you. I believe the resurrection of Jesus because I have seen him. I've seen him in the way that you have loved children. The ones that are here on Sundays. The, one, the way that you have loved them. The ones who are here five days a week at Sunshine Valley. I see the way that you love people who are hungry and need in homes. Whether that's at Prism, the food shelf, Simpson Shelter, Meals on Wheels, I have seen how you have decided to keep miracles going. And I have seen it in the ways that you have been a statement for open inclusion for LGBTQI plus people for next year, 20 years. I believe in the resurrection. Not just because the Bible tells me so, but because you live it with your lives. May you keep going. Glory. Hallelujah. Amen.